All right, Robert, we're here on generosity and investment. So why did you pick this topic and why specifically talking about generosity and investment? I think for me it was the next level um, of my financial journey. You know, after, you know, we were able to be good stewards, then it's now what? If you're a good steward, then that means there's going to be some surplus of, of finance. And, you know, you can do either one of these things. You could be generous with that extra finance or you can invest it. But for me, it was, the, it was important for me to do both at the same time. You know, and a lot of people think, well, you know, I can't, you know, maybe I don't have a lot of resource, you know, to be generous and to invest. But wherever we are, you know, whatever our situation is, we can start there. And it's not about an amount. It's about a principle, you know, applying, right. applying principles as you begin, begin to become more financially successful or more financially stable, apply principles that later on you can increase you know, volume or, right, or right. dollar amounts, you know, too. So you're just talking about making that baseline where you, you, cause you see the connection between being generous and be, having funds to invest because God wants to get things that the, the famous saying, right? If God can get money through you, he'll get it to you. Right. Exactly. And so there's that concept of if God can get money and use you as a vessel to be generous to others, it'll allow you to continue to grow on in the investment aspect. Right. And I think there's a, uh, you know, and, and as, as we deal with money and we deal with our relationship with God, there's always a spiritual side to it. And then there's a practical or, a, you know, a physical, you know, side to what we do. Right. And so being generous for me is that spiritual side, you know, is is you allowing God to get involved with your situation as you become generous, whether that's to God's house, God's people or others around you, that God will bless you. And as you as you invest, you're being responsible. You're mm -hmm. you're doing that physical side of it. That uh, you know, God, <clears throat> excuse me, God requires us to be responsible with our finance. So we invest, and then so God, uh, you know, God's natural response to us is, okay, you're being responsible. So therefore, I'm right. going to be able to trust you with more and give you more. And so, but both of these things are very important. And you know, for me, you know, the the most or the, the biggest benefit that I've had, or for me, when it comes to generosity, you know, I've seen the biggest result. I've seen God move right. in a supernatural way and do things that I couldn't do on my own. And yeah. I am able to look back and say, you know, when you're generous towards God's house, God does things that you can't do on your own. Right. Well, let's dive right in. We're going to be talking about generosity investment in the kingdom of God. And so uh, the title of the message is The Generous Investor, Building Wealth and Impacting Lives. And so what is it to be generous? To be generous is someone who is willing to give more than is necessary or expected out of gratitude and appreciation. And ultimately, this is God's plan for our money. God's plan is that we become blessed, and once we're blessed, that we become generous. And so, when we become blessed, that we become generous not only to His house, but to His people, and to those around us. Galatians 6.10 says, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those of the household of faith. 2 Corinthians 9.11 says, You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. So, in my opinion, generosity is the key to financial success. And giving in a generous way is spiritual. Something supernatural happens when you give this way. Proverbs 11.25 says, The generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. And so, maybe you're thinking, how can I be generous without a lot of money? It's by trusting the stewardship process. 
The stewardship process is understanding that it's our responsibility to multiply what God has put in our hands. Always make room for God and His people in our finances, and then we can watch God see, we can watch God move in our finances through our generosity, triggering miracles and blessings. Dave Ramsey has the famous quote, If you learn to live like no one else today, later you can live like no one else. And it's true when you decide to adopt a generous attitude. And we can be generous at any level of life. You don't have to have an abundance to begin to start or to start to be generous. You can do it at the base level of life. There's a story of a woman in 2 Kings um, chapter 4, verse 8, and it talks about this woman seeing a need and, and was able to be generous or prepare generous offerings just from the needs that she saw before her. So uh, let's read that. One day Elisha went to Shunem, and a well-to-do woman was there who urged him, uh, who her, urged him to stay for a meal. Whenever he came by, he stopped and ate. And so this is a woman that saw, hey, you know what? Here's a man of God. He's coming by. I can do something. And it's just, just with a meal, just with the basic things of life. And you and I tonight, we can also begin to be generous with the basic things. But the interesting thing is that she saw and she prepared. You and I can also see and prepare. We know that we have needs here in our church every year, sometimes at the same time, in the same place, right? Can you say conference? Conference is coming. We know there's going to be needs. Revivals are on the calendar a month in advance. And Children's Church World Evangelism offerings, they come at the same time. We're going to start that pretty soon here. But we can prepare for these needs that we know that are coming. You know, when we opened our produce business, me and my wife, we said, out of every load of, of produce that we bring in, we're going to set aside a little bit of, of that profit for world evangelism. And, you know, it's interesting that we made that decision to make room for God in that company. And out of that company, we've seen other companies come out of there. Other sources of income came out of there. You know, this past year, we opened a new entity. And the day that we got our checkbook, it just so happened that we came to church. And I brought the checkbook to church, and I was like, what an opportunity to give the first check out of our company, out of our new company, give the first check to church. And when I gave that, God reminded me of when I did that for our real estate company. When we, went, we, uh, when we opened our real estate company, we went to Tucson Conference, and in that conference, I took this checkbook for this company that wasn't making any money, that was just new. It was taking a lot of investment for us to start up. And I, I remember I just took it out and I said, I'm just going to give a few hundred dollars. It's just an offering. I just want to link this company to what God is doing here. And God spoke to me and he told me, one day you will give. And I'm sorry if the, the, <laughs> the amount offends you, but he said, one day you will give $100,000 offerings out of this company. And I looked at my check that I was giving for a few hundred dollars, and I said, that's not possible. At the time, that we had a projection that uh, that company that year would lease out um, some rental space, and the total amount of tithe for that profit on that rental space was going to be $6,000 a year. So how could I say, how could God tell me this? Like, how is this possible? It's just not possible. But, you know, he didn't argue with me. He just told me that. He put that in my heart. Whatever, time goes by. And the reality is, is that we've been able to see that come to pass. And so that's what God can do if you begin to make room for him and you are generous with what you have. Now, it is our responsibility to multiply what we have. It says it in Matthew 25, 27. It says, he's telling, the, this is the, the master telling the, the one talent servant, well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the banker so when I return, I could receive back interest. 
And what he's saying is that I'm expecting there to be a return on what I put in your hands. The more responsible and productive that we are with our money, the more God gets involved. And you're probably thinking, okay, well, how do we start, right? Last week we talked about let's organize our finances. Let's have a plan. Let's track our expenses. Let's, let's, let's put, make a budget. Let's put some life insurance in place. Let's save for an emergency. Let's pay off debt, mostly, you know, high interest debt. And, you know, these are the things that get you to the place that once you do this, that you end up having money left over. So then now what? We have money left over. How do we, how do we multiply $100, $200, $300, the basic level? And I'm going to explain here a, diff- a bunch of different ways that you could multiply or invest your money. You could buy a business, right? You're thinking with $100, no. Not, follow me here. You could buy a business, but if you have money to invest and you buy a business, um, I've done that before and, and it didn't go too well. You could put your money in, in precious metals, right? You could buy real estate. You could buy cryptocurrency, You could buy stocks on an app. You can do all these things, but the reality is that all these things are going to take time to learn. There's a learning curve that could be very lengthy. It takes specific dollar amounts, capital, risk, liability. All these different things come into play when you're putting your money in something and you're investing. You could start a side hustle. You know, when I first got saved, I... um, I started cutting grass. I had one lawnmower, and then I had two lawnmowers, and I had two weed eaters, and I had three guys working. And I did that for a little while, but I didn't like the sun. So I didn't want to do that anymore. But then I started selling produce off the back of my truck. Took a little bit of money, bought some produce, multiplied it, and I began to see, hey, you know what? I can invest this little bit of money, and I can multiply it. So you could start a side hustle that eventually can turn into a business, and I personally believe that there are business owners that are sitting in our church that haven't become business owners yet. I think there's a a whole new generation of business owners that are going to come out of our church. If you decide to be a business owner, you need to understand that you need to know the numbers. One of the biggest things that I see with people that want to have a business, but they don't understand the numbers, is they get in trouble. And so you need to understand the numbers. I remember Ray telling me, Robert, if you're good with money, you'll never have a money problem. You'll never have a money issue. And you know what? Banks will beg you to do business with them. And I was like, really? They're running from me now. But he said, they'll beg you. And we've seen it. They come around, hey, I'd like your business. I like your business. Because everybody wants to be a part of a good business. So... You can invest in all these things, you can do a startup, but all these things will consume your time. Or you can buy into successful companies by acquiring them through mutual funds. And so this is where I started. If you want to know where I invested the first dollar, or we, I have a, a, a trouble doing that. Uh, we say I, and then I look at my wife and she looks at me and I say we. But You can start to invest into mutual funds. That's where I started. No effort. Uh, It's done automatically. You can start with $50 a month. Um, Very simple to do. There's a book that we recommended in the the references called Simple Wealth, Inevitable Wealth. It teaches you about mutual funds, investing, the different aspects and stuff like that. Very good book, very small. It's 180 pages. It's very little. But you're able to get into a mutual fund by starting an, an investment account. And usually this is offered by your employer uh, through a 401k, a 403b, just depending if you're a teacher, government worker, different things. And so the most important things, you know, I've talked to people that their companies offer them investment accounts, retirement accounts, and they don't take it because they don't, they don't think, you know, it's important or whatever. But their companies do matches, six to, uh, three to six percent. This is free money that people don't take advantage of. But that's one of the benefits from employer accounts. They're easy to set up. They get tax benefits. So many different things. If you don't have an employer that does that, you could use a broker and open what they call an individual retirement arrangement, which is an an IRA. 
And there's traditional IRAs, there's Roth IRAs. When you're getting to this step, it's very important to find somebody that knows what they're doing so they can help you to work all these different things out. But there's different benefits. There's tax benefits. There's different benefits. And um, you can, so if you don't have an employer that does it, you can go through the outside. And that's how we started. That's how we started with our kids, with our, with our college funds and our retirement accounts and all that. Go through a brokerage company. And, you know, if you say, well, I don't know where to start. Or, I don't know even the beginning. Allstate, New York Life, farmers, um, banks have wealth management departments. There's, it's endless to where you can, where you can get. What I use, used and use, is farmers. Why? Because when I, I met Ray Villarreal uh, through farmers, not only did I gain an access to begin to start investing, but I gained a mentor. And that's something that you need to look out for when you're beginning to invest. Somebody that's going to take time, has a heart of a teacher, wants to teach you things. You know, he would teach me things like every dollar has a goal. If it's meant for retirement, it needs to be invested a certain way. If it's meant to be used in five years or 10 years, it needs to be invested a certain way. And so a good advisor is going to help to organize all that. But not only was he a good advisor, he had Christian values. He had, he had experience with life. He had experience with business. And that was all very helpful. Why am I mentioning all that? Because there is so much noise and information when it comes to investing. It's just so much, especially with YouTube, it's incredible, right? And so there's so much information out there, positive, negative. And once you find somebody that has the heart of a teacher that shares values with you, it's a little easier to work through all that stuff. And so you can do your own research. Dave Ramsey, his, his website is incredible. He's got so much information. I mean, if you really wanted to learn, you could go on there. There's, there's tutorials. There's uh, questionnaires. There's a lot of good stuff there. Uh, the Gateway Church has a stewardship section. They have a bunch of uh, investment information that is very helpful. But in short, if you don't know what a mutual fund is, I'm going to try my best to explain it to you here. And so Ray used to always tell me, you want to be, you want to be an owner, not a loner. So a mutual fund gives you the opportunity to be an owner. It's managed by um, educated professionals. They have a proven track records for you to be able to successfully invest and have a good return. It provides diversification and it, and it provides liquidity. For example, if you buy a piece of property and you say, I want to invest here in a piece of property, you buy it. And then you say tomorrow, hey, I need my money. Well, you got to put a for sale sign on it. And normally when you want to sell a piece of property, my experience is when you want to sell it, they don't want to buy it. And when you don't want to sell it, they want to buy it. And so investment, uh, mutual funds gives you that liquidity. So this is what you would, could say is a mutual fund, right? So I, it's a bunch of pencils, right? And so I put them in different directions and there's different colors and because this is what a mutual fund represents. It's thousands of investors putting their money into a fund or an account where professional managers manage it. And usually it, they invest into hundreds of, at least a hundred companies. And it could be, it could include stocks. It could include bonds. It could include savings. It could include commodities. The idea here is the diversification. And so if you take your money and you say, hey, I want to invest in stocks. I want to invest in one stock. I want to invest in Nike, right? Don't move. I want to invest in Nike. Well, Nike does well, and then Nike does bad. And when you want your money, Nike Nike's not doing too well. Oh, Nike doesn't. Sorry, Nike. I love you. I, I buy a bunch of Nikes, I promise. So, but just as an example, you put your money in one company, the company goes bad, so does your money, right? You put your money in a mutual fund, and say the company, one company is going bad, there's professionals that are watching that company that say, you're doing bad, we're going to take you out, and then we're going to put another company in, in your place. And that one wasn't supposed to come out. 
But they put another one in in its place, therefore always giving you a good average of return on your money. So this is what is, what is a mutual fund. So what's a bond? A bond is basically you loaning money to a government entity or a company. That's what a bond is. It's secure money. You make very little interest. What is a stock? A stock is buying a piece of a company. But like I explained, if you put your money in a stock and it crashes, then your money could be worth zero. In a mutual fund, it's so diversified that it'll always be worth something. Even if at the lowest point of the stock market, it's so diversified that they're always watching it, that it'll always be worth something. And a lot of times when the market's changing, they're able to change this to protect your investment for that time that the market's falling. So that's why I'm a believer of, stock, of mutual funds. So I want to explain something to you that's called opportunity cost. Now, opportunity cost is what me and you pay for not taking the opportunity to invest as soon as possible. So I have some slides here I want to show you. So this person was 18 right out of high school. They started working at McDonald's. And they said, I'm going to take $100 from my monthly check, and I'm going to invest it into a mutual fund. So let's just say they put it in a mutual fund, $100. They started with $100. They put $100 a month when they're 18. They retire when they're 67. It's a retirement account, so it requires you to put the money in there, leave it in there until you retire. Unless, if not, there's tax penalties. There's uh, uh, some uh, tax consequences, penalties. So this is how much they would, they would just by putting $100 away every month, they would be a millionaire when they retired, right? 1.5 million. Okay, go to the next one. So you're at 25, you say, okay, you know what? Uh, I got a family now, I got to start thinking. So you'd start doing it. The difference between waiting seven years, this is what opportunity cost is. The difference between waiting seven years is half of the value of that mutual fund. So let's go to the next one. So you say you're 30 now. 30. There you go. So you're 30 and you say, hey, I'm 30, so I got to start doing, I got to put more, so I'm going to do double. I'm going to do $200 a month. And so being 30, doing $200 a month, it was a lot cheaper being 18, doing $100 a month. So then you get 900000 right? So then let's look at the next one. So then you say, 40, I got to start doing better. I got to start doing more. So let's start putting $300 a month. And you end up with less money, putting more money at 40 than you did at 30. So then you say, I'm 50, right? So let's go to the next one. You're 50, so you're saying, I really got to get ahead. So let's go $500 a month, and you end up with $268,000. So that's what opportunity cost is. The, the sooner we start is the better. That's what I'm trying to explain. And so there's a few, thank you for that. So there's a few reasons why people don't begin to invest. In their money. Oh, no, because look at what happened with Bernie Madoff. That's why I'm not going to put my money there, right? You guys know who Bernie Madoff is? Okay, maybe you don't. I do. But anyways, he was a shyster. So fear of the stock market. Oh, it goes up and then it crashes and we're going to lose everything. The lack of money due to lack of uh, good financial management or prioritizing. Because if we think about it, we're only looking for $100 or $200 a month. We're not looking for all of our paychecks to go into this stuff, right? And so I found this, uh, this little statistic. It says, the shares of Americans who, who own stocks has never been higher or never been so high. About 58% of U.S. households own stocks in 2022. So 58% of America is doing this, and the other 42% of it could be some of us. We're not taking advantage of it, right? Warren Buffett says, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The next best time is today. So I would really um, urge you to begin to inquire of this stuff because you can start with so little bit and you can end up having something for you and your family um, without you having to lose focus of your life. You don't have to take any attention off your kids. You don't have to take any attention off your wives. You can keep coming to church, keep doing everything, and you're still multiplying your money. The data shows that people that don't have money invested into retirement, into any investment account, 
is not because of lack of uh, the best portfolio. Like, oh, no, because uh, I'm not going to invest in that fund because it charges you too much when you put the money in. Or, no, I'm not going to invest in that because um, I don't believe that um, they should invest the, the money in that, in that company. It's not because of everything being perfect. People don't have money invested for their retirement or invested for their family or their kids because they just never started. You know, when we started, we started with $50 a month. My financial advisor was just, just do $50 a month per, per, per family member. And what he was trying to get me to do is just build a habit. And when I had extra money, I said, hey, I have extra money. I can put more and more and more and begin to see better results. So, but it's the most simple way. Right now, we have, we, have, we're, we have several companies. And when you have the experience of dealing with business, employees, taxes, so many different industries, different markets, you begin to see the value of investing in something like that. Because all you do is, here, take my money, go invest it, make money. You don't have to worry about it. And so it's a very, it's a very good thing that, they, that can be helpful to you. And like I said, I recommend that you get inquired of it and begin to start that. Now, our jobs to multiply, but we also have another way we can, we can multiply is by being generous. This is God moving supernaturally in our lives. So generosity triggers miracles. And so there are some types of miracles that we understand that we need. And there's others that we don't understand that we're going to need in the future. You know, this past year, me being sick, you know, I was spending a lot of time at home in my closet praying. I needed a miracle. I wanted God to do something. The doctors couldn't tell me what was wrong with me. And I remember being in there one day and just praying and really asking God, God, I need a miracle. And I was begging God for him to heal me. And you know what God told me? He told me, I want you to give three offerings. And I was like, what does that have to do with this? You know, I was really, you know, wanting him just to instantly. And he says, I want you to give three offerings. I call pastor, hey, pastor, they weren't for our church. They were, they were for other things. Hey, pastor, I'm going to give this. And this is what I feel God is telling me to do. And so we do it. A few months later, um, the time passes by and pastor calls me and says, hey, I want to know if you want to go with the team to Africa. And I'm like... If God makes me better and heals me, I'll go. And that was me challenging God. That was me telling God, hey, this is my way out of this. you got to make me better, you know. A few months pass by, and I'm with Pastor. And, uh, I'm, we're, you know, we're talking. I'm, everything's fine. I feel good. And he tells me, hey, are you going to Africa? And I was like, I, then I felt like, man, if I don't say yes, I'm not going to feel better anymore. So I said, yeah, I'll go. And I remembered, you know, I said, God, if you make me feel better, right? So he calls Pastor Safa. Hey, I got some good news. The team just grew by three. And he tells Pastor Safa, you know, we're going. And um, so we end up going and, and, um, and uh, you know, so we go, we take the trip. Pastor Safa asks hey, do you mind sharing your testimony? And that turned into preaching. I don't know how that happened, but it turned into preaching and picking up offerings and all this stuff, right? Well, it was really interesting that, you know, I'm there when I'm there and, and uh, I'm praying in, in my closet that day. God tells me, I want you to give an offering for the building fund for Sierra Leone. When, I, when I'm behind the pulpit taking the offering, in Sierra Leone, in that building project, God was reminding me, like, you, you wanted a miracle, right? But you didn't know that, that through this giving, this is how I was going to do that miracle. And so some of our giving is going to be linked to miracles that we know. But like I said, others are not things that we don't know. You know, in this story that I just read of the Shunammite woman, you know, she saw a need, she made, she prepared, she made, you know, provision for the man of God. And she arranged her life to take advantage of the opportunity that God was giving her to be generous. And that turned into, you can read it on your own time in 2 Kings chapter 4, but that turned into a meal, it went from a meal, turned into a room. Then it's like a bed and a table and a lamp. And 
doing all these things because she wanted to be generous. And it's really interesting. Uh, uh, 2 Kings uh, 4.13 says, um, this, is, this, is the, this, is the, this is Elisha telling his servant to go and ask the, the, ask the Shunammite woman, is there anything do you, that you need? Is there anything, you've been kind to us, and is there anything you need? And it says, now he said to him, uh, say to her, look, you have been concerned for us with, with all this care. What can I do for you? Do you want me to speak on behalf to the king or the commander of the army? And what he's trying to say is, is there anything you, that I can do for you? And she says, no. But then he tells her in verse 16, about this time next year, you will be holding a son in your arms. And so what he's saying is that the, the, his servant ended up telling him, hey, you know what? She doesn't have a son. She's, she says she doesn't need anything, but she doesn't have a son. So what he says, you know what? God's going to bless you with a son. So that generosity opened the door for a son. But then her son dies. And her, her, uh, the son's father ends up bringing that son, that miracle, to, her, to his mother, dead, and tells him, hey, this happened. He died. So she goes back to the man of God and she tells him, hey, my son's dead. I need help. And, she, and he gives her instructions and she doesn't accept them. She wants him to come and see her son. He ends up going back, seeing his son, prays for him, and he comes back to life. Her generosity put her in that position that she had this relationship with the man of God that ended up saving her son's life. You know, I know exactly what that feels like, and I know exactly what that is. You know, this past conference, Pastor Roman's picking up an offering in San Antonio, and he's talking about miracles that are linked to giving. And God reminded me of when my son was born. My wife had complications. You know, they told me, wait in this room, we'll come get you. She had to have a C-section. They never came for me. Hours went by, and I'm like, what's going on? When they finally take me there... They're like, hey, here's your wife. She's going to have the baby. Everything's real quick. But what I didn't know is that through the anesthesia, she was having complications and, they were, and she was going in and out. And the last thing my wife remembers is them telling her or them, her, her hearing them say, we're losing her, we're losing her. And chaos in the operating room. You know, when I go in, they say, here's your wife. Give her a kiss. She's going that way. Your son's going that way. So then they put me in another room. And they, have, they keep my son somewhere else. And then they finally bring me out to see my son. And when I see my son, something's wrong. His stomach is being, he's sucking his stomach all the way in. And then it's just blowing up like a balloon. And the nurse sees me and she comes out and, and she starts crying. And she says, and she used to come to our church, so she knew me. And that's probably why she felt so bad. But she's crying and she's saying, Robert, I don't think he's going to make it. He's going to ICU right now. So my wife's recovering. I have to go tell my wife. You know, so I go to tell my wife, and, you know, I'm strong all the way over there. And as soon as I get there, I just, Phew. and I tell my, tell my wife, and I, my wife says, take me to him right now. And she takes us to him, and this is him. He can't breathe. He can't eat. Um, they have him all hooked up, and that's him. You can go to the next one. And so that's email. That's a few weeks after he had to stay for several weeks, RJ. A lot of people don't even know the story. Um, but yeah, the pastor at the time would tell me, you better take pictures of him and remind him every day of his life he's a miracle baby. No, nah, not every day. <laughs> but remind him. But I remember, while pastor's picking up this offering, God reminds me of this. The, next, the other thing he reminds me of, back in 2012, he was picking up, thank you for that. Back in 2012, he was picking up an offering for our building project. Uh, here at the old building and I remember he's picking up and he's pooling he needs a large amount of money and me and my wife talk and we say you know what let's give at this time this is 2012 RJ is already five years old we haven't been able to have another child and we said let's give maybe we can have another uh, another kid and um my mother's like excited we're excited yeah maybe this is God's gonna do something right so we give and well everybody knows we don't have another kid right when he's picking up this offering, this is last year, this is 2023, right? When he's picking up this offering, he reminds me of my granddaughter. See, when, my, when we found out that in, in 2022, when we found out that my, that, my, that my daughter was pregnant, 
There was some complications, some issues, and it was possible that she wasn't going to be born. And God reminded me, he said, remember when you gave in 2012, you wanted another child? You didn't know that I was going to protect your granddaughter and that I was going to give you your granddaughter. And so I have a picture of my granddaughter. <laughs> I'm like just trying to look for an opportunity to show a picture of my granddaughter. Right? But God told me, that's a gift from your generosity. Thank you. So not only does generosity trigger miracles, but generosity tr triggers blessing. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 says, um, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will reap generously. And so, in my opinion, as a business owner, as a businessman, if I could call myself that, my biggest return on my money has been being generous to God's house. When I wanted to get into real estate, I bought a piece of land. And they said, land will make you rich. Um, income producing uh, property makes you a living. If you can buy land in a good location, hold on to it, it will multiply many times over. So I bought a piece of land. And after owning it for three years, my endurance for investing and having money locked up was very low. I wasn't a good investor. So I said, you know what, I'm going to sell this piece of land. And I sold it, and I took that money, and I bought something else. Within a few months, I'm not months, sorry, within a few years, the guy I sold it to calls me and says, hey, they're offering me five times more than what, than what you sold it to me for. Should I sell it or should I keep it? And I told him, you should keep it. I should have kept it. <laughs> but when I took that money and I reinvested it, I put it somewhere, and I put it in a very specific uh, um, property, and the reason that I put it in that property, because around the time that I was um, looking to move that investment, we were building the church building, and I was so involved and invested in the church building that I, became, I started to learn, hey, the cost of development, property, the cost to build, I started to understand the cost of financing when it came to commercial industrial property. I was so involved that I knew everything when we were, when we, by the time we were done. So I bought this particular piece of property, understanding that. And within a few years, that investment multiplied a thousand percent. So I'm thinking, I sold this piece of property, this land. Man, I blew it. I could have made all this money. But God knew what was going on, and God knew how he was going to protect me and help me. And I linked that to being generous to God's house. And so in my business world, in my business life, I've had three goals, three main goals. The first one was to own a business that was profitable. The second was to replace the business that I had in case something would ever happen to the first business, right? Like a backup plan. The third was to retire when I was 40. God has made all those things come to pass in my life. And like I said, the, my biggest accomplishment, if you could say, is linking my finances to God and putting God's house, God's people, inside my financial plan. And so, from here forward, now what's next? Next is, my only goal is to have a financial legacy that honors God. If God's going to bless us, if God's going to move in our life, he has to get the honor. He has to get the glory, right? So if he blesses us to a certain extent, it'd be good that, we, that someone say, yes, God blessed them, but they were able to use what God gave them for God's kingdom. And that's my goal in life. And so that's all I have for tonight. I want to open it up for some questions. So anybody have questions? Questions. Okay, go ahead. Um, I just wanted the name of that book that you said it was called Simple Wealth. Simple, Some... Simple Wealth, Inevitable Wealth. Okay. It, it was the first book that was given to me when I started investing. It's, it's little, and um, it's a great book. Nick Murray, uh, very good when it comes to investing. Um, good book. Anybody else? Any more questions? Ruben?
Um, <clears throat> a question that I've always kind of had is um, when it comes to generational wealth, right? When you're talking about uh, creating a legacy for your family, um, what do you, I mean, I know this is probably more of a opinion brought rather than, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer, but um, how do you feel or what do you think about having your kids make their own like, and so that's one of the things that I've kind of thought about. Like I've, I've heard people that, you know, kind of when um, you give things to your children and you just hand it to them, they don't understand the developmental costs. A lot of times they don't understand how to deal with things. Um, so when it comes to generational wealth, when you're talking about building something, not only for the house of God, but also for your own family, what do you, where do you stand on that? Or what do you think about that? Like, should you say, hey, you know, this is partition. I'm only going to do it if you meet X and X goals or, you know, what, what would be a healthy way to, to address that in the idea of passing down money, basically? Because even, even, you know, I look at it like, yeah, as, as me individually, I'm going to invest in my future, but I'm also investing eventually in my children's and my grandchildren's future. So I don't want to create a stumbling block by, right. you know, giving them access to things that they shouldn't have access to yet. So it's kind of my long question, but. Well, you know, and it's, it's kind of conflicting, right? Because um, there's people that are successful. Like I feel that I am and I feel no one gave me anything. My parents didn't give me anything. Um, I had to figure it all out by myself. And I say, they didn't give me anything. I'm not going to give them anything. But what does God's word say? A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, right? Right. So that doesn't mean that you you put them in the position where they, they'll never develop, but that just means that you're able to show them, give them something, right? And so I think that it, there has to be some thought and there has to be some structure. We're going to talk about, you know, that financial legacy stuff next week, um, the structure and all that stuff. Um, but I think if you look at Donald Trump, right, his dad gave him a million dollars, we're going to lend him a million dollars, <laughs> and he made five billion dollars. Right. If you say, hey, I'm going to give my kid a million dollars, but it's going to ruin him or I'm going to give my kid a million dollars and he's going to become a titan. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's two. So and, and like I said, we're going to go over this. But with that gift or that privilege, there has to be education. There has to be structure. Right. Like um, I know guys that say, hey, you know what? I'm telling my kids all this stuff belongs to them everything but i'm telling them if they don't do this this and this they ain't getting nothing yeah. if they get into drugs and alcohol and things that are going to ruin their lives they ain't getting nothing right and then other people they give them everything and we know that there's ruin you know their lives are ruined there and so the biggest thing for me like i said we're going to discuss it a little bit more is education and impartation of vision your goals god gave you goals god gave you purpose Right. And when he blesses you, he's, there's going to be accountability for that. And that finance that he gave you has to have an end goal. Right. We have to pass that down to our kids. Like, hey, you know what? This is why we're blessed. This is what we do. The vision, the purpose and all that stuff. And I'm giving away all my material for next week. But anyhow, Ruben got ahead. So that's kind of my perspective on that. But, you know, God blesses you. And you're going to have to bless your kids. So there's going to have to be some blessing. You know, the other day I'm sitting there and I'm saying that, you know, because me and mother fight about this, right, all the time. I ain't giving our kids nothing. Yet. We got to give them something. Right? No. And, I remember, and God spoke to me. He's like, did I do that to you? You get saved. You get your heart right. You do right. And boom, you have all this blessing, all this access, right? So that's kind of something you need to balance. Now, depending on your kids, what they're doing and all that stuff, um, you got to work all that stuff out. But we'll talk a little bit more about that next week. Yeah. Good question, Ruben. Stacy. Um, our kids, like, they get birthday money. They have, they have a little bit. They don't have, like, tons. But what do you, because I know my Kaya, he's been on me, like, Mom, his teacher's like, we, uh, we need to put it in the IRA. And then he's throwing all these names at me, yeah. and I'm like, I don't know what that means. Like, right. so what do you recommend for, for them and their, specifically their money, not money that we give them, money that they've saved on their own. It's literally sitting in a piggy bank. Yeah, I think uh, as soon as you can get, you can open a custodial account for them. 
a bank account where you're on it. You can see what's going on with it. I think that's good. It teaches them about banking, teaches them about uh, how things work and all that. Um, if you don't have a if you don't have a college fund for him, then you could start doing that. Now, a college fund is really good because uh, you don't get taxed on the growth. You get taxed on the money going in. You don't get taxed on the growth. Um, it's meant to be used for college. If you don't use it for college, you can transfer it to another account. And so, and it can be, at that time, they'll be, have different tax, you know, consequences for doing that. But if you get him, if he's got money and you're not investing for his college, say, you know what? You start investing for your future, you know, in a 529 college plan. And then he can start thinking, you start thinking about what you want to be, what kind of, you know, what do you want to go? Do you want to go to school of trade? Or do you want to go, you know, to be a teacher? You want to be a doctor? What do you want to be? Let's, let's start investing in your future, start getting him to think like that. So, like I said, RJ was going to be an astronaut, so... We saved all this money, and then, you know, videographer and all that stuff started <laughs> coming in there. And so that's what you can do. You know, there's other ways. You can also put their money in a CD or, you know, there's money market accounts, you know, that'll gain a little bit of interest. You can start doing stuff like that. Um, I think the best thing is to sit down maybe with um, some type of, like, sit down with your bank, see what they offer, something like that, um, and they'll give you different options you know, for stuff like that. It's just about getting a little bit educated and then money always has a goal, right? I, I kind of touched on that a little bit. So depending on the goal for the money is depending on the vehicle, the structure of the money, because there's consequences when you invest the, the uh, money with the wrong goal, right? Then you start moving money around and, eh? oh, I'm having it in this account, I want to move it over here and then I want to do this. You end up paying a lot of different fees and, you know, in saying that, if you want to invest, but you're going to be looking at the stock market like 24-7 and not sleeping. Maybe investing is not the best thing for you, but, but um, I would maybe start with something like that. Anybody else? Question? Jamie? At any point, are you talking about like wills and trusts and property transfers and how God sees all of that? So, so um, in the financial legacy, there's structure. And yes, I'm going to be touching up a little bit on that stuff. And probably we can ask questions once I get through some of that. Um, but yes, wills, trusts, directives, um, estate planning, all that stuff is super important. Anybody else have a question? Oh, over here. When, when you said generosity triggers miracles, is that all generosity or just towards the church generosity? No, I think God, um, I think God uh, wants us to be generous to everyone around us. You know, if we see a need, we can be generous. Because what happens if, let's say they're not, I'm, I mean, if, if somebody's in a bad situation because they're putting themselves there, like, like they abuse drugs, like, for example, right? And you just, you want to give all your attention to being generous to that person. That's probably not the best best situation right but when somebody sees you as a christian and they see you being generous you're a good testimony you know they're able to see hey man god save them look at look at their lives and so you're a good testimony and so i believe god wants us to be generous uh you know all the time people around us sometimes our money you know it's will be wasted a little bit or whatever but what happens to us because we have that attitude we have that heart is god's gonna bless us but the god's word says you know, that we should put God's house first and his people first. It says primarily, right, that that's what we should focus on. So, uh, any other questions? You? Um, as far as, like, investing goes, like stocks and crypto and all that, do you have, like, certain uh, platforms you suggest or, like, apps uh, and to like manage your portfolio and stuff like that? Yeah, so I don't manage anything. I don't have an app. I don't check anything. I get my statements and I shred them. I don't even pay attention to them. Why? Because all the money that I have invested in mutual funds is for later. So I don't need to pay attention to what's going on right now. I understand the fund. I understand the rate of return. I understand what's supposed to happen. Yes, yearly. Do I check? Do I talk to them? I used to sit down every six months um, with my financial guy and we'd kind of go over stuff and all that. But, you know, things, I'm a little bit more educated, a little bit more structured now to be doing that. But what I'm trying to get at is that the best thing to do 
is not to invest in things that are going to take your time and your effort and your energy because those things take learning. And there's already systems in place that can eliminate all that for you. So my advice is to find a financial advisor that shares the same goals, that shares the same vision as you. Not all of them do. And find them and begin to work out the issues and the questions that you have about investing and invest into a mutual fund. And that mutual fund, you know, will give you everything that you need um, as far as a return on your money. That's my opinion. I do not do it. I had gotten into a while back when Bitcoin started really taking off. I had gotten into crypto, looking into crypto uh, systems that, that uh, are structured to be able to handle that t the cryptocurrency and all that stuff, investing in that. I got into it. And it's like, this is way too much. I don't need to be a part of it. And then the Bitcoin fell like super hard. So I was like, you know, so I just stay focused on one. And I'll be honest with you. So probably 50% of our investment is in real estate right now. The others in business and, and mutual funds and stuff like that. We're, we're really considering uh, the percentage of that and moving more into mutual funds and stuff like that. Just because of the value that you get for not having to worry about all the different stuff. And so, hope that answers your question. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Well, I was always told that um, when you give something, you don't have to expect anything back, right? So I will feel always uh, guilty that I to, to give something and then say, God, please help me with this or whatever. Is it okay to, to, to give and expect something in return? Um, I mean, you, you, I guess we shouldn't give expecting something in return. That shouldn't be the reason of why we give. And that's the difference of, of generosity and giving, expecting something in return. Because when you give in a generous way, your, do, your heart, your attitude is saying, hey, I'm doing this because I want to be a blessing. I want to help somebody. And when God sees that, the natural response of God is that he's going to bless you. Right. Because God knows our heart before we even give anything. God knows why we're doing it and, and all that. He knows our intentions and all that. But when you do it with the right heart, God is naturally going to bless you. You can't. In other words, you can't stop the way that God works and he functions. Even if you say, God, I don't want you to give me anything. I'm just going to give. God's going to give. God's going to bless you. That's who God is. God's a giver. The first thing he ever gave us is his son. Right. That on the cross. He's showing us that God's a giver, that that's his character. And when we're generous, that's what he does to us. That's the natural response. So anybody else question? Kevin? No, I'm sorry. I thought you were raising your hand. Larry? What's the difference between Roth IRA and mutual fund? Okay. Well, a Roth IRA... So Roth IRA, traditional IRA, and I'm just gonna I'm just gonna let them all loose here. Simple account, SEP account, 4013B, 401k, 457. All those are the structures in which the rules and the laws are gonna apply to the money that's invested. Right? So some of them you say you don't pay tax, you you're, you get a tax exemption because the money goes in and the government's going to help you right now. Hey, I invested 500 bucks. Okay, that's going to be an exemption. Right? Some of them, you pay taxes on the money. And when it goes in and it grows, and while it's growing, you don't pay taxes. Some of it, you pay taxes going in, taxes going up, taxes coming out, because you've already maximized those retirement type of accounts, right? So that's that's the type of investment account. The mutual fund is the type of fund, the type of account in which your money is going to be invested. Like I mentioned, a mutual fund is a bunch of different stocks, bonds, different, different investments, right? That's what a mutual fund is. You can do all those investments. You can do them all independently, or you can do them as a mutual fund. The mutual fund's better. You can have an IRA in this mutual fund. You can have a 529 college fund for your kids in this mutual fund. It, they're just, it's just different types of accounts. Like I said, different rules. That stock wasn't good. 
this different rules apply to different, you know, to different accounts. Did that, is that, did that help you? Okay. Any other questions? Give me to the recent. We'll do um, Elisha one and, and Stacy. So going into this, I wasn't really particularly as educated about investments and, and different parts with the financial class. So now I don't have the excuse of the education factor. So the, my question is, um, can you provide some advice in regards to your mental aspect when you first started out the business of the produce and then moving on to other um, businesses? Because for me, I'm inspired to want to do something. But getting to that point where it's like, okay, I got to take that risk and see what happens and then have the patience to go along with the process and trust the process, even though there may not be any money in the bank account. And I still have to say, okay, we got to stick to our guns here. So could you provide advice mentally or your motivating aspect? I know that's probably a horrible word to use, but just what kept you in order to be able to say, okay, I'm going to keep going. I'm not quitting. I'm not, you know, I'm pressing on until I see the fruit. I think um, one of the things that that people, um, I guess, maybe don't realize is that they see, like, I'm up here explaining 20 years of my experience with God, whether that be giving, whether that be business, uh, my relationship with my wife and the way that we've done things. This is 20 years, right? And the reality is I didn't know what the next step was from one day to the other sometimes, right? But just staying in relationship with God, God guides you. God directs you. He gives you discernment. He helps you. Um, like I mentioned, when, you're, when you include God in your finances, God's going to make a way for you. How do you take somebody that's uneducated, has no experience. The other day I was with, I was with somebody, there, we were there at my house, and they're asking me what I do, and they're telling me, and I tell them, well, I do a little bit of produce, a little bit of real estate, you know, a little this, a little that, you know? And they're like, how, do you, how did you get into these industries that are totally, you know, polar opposite? And I'm like, I don't know. It just happened. Things just happened. God, you know, open a door for this, open a door for that, begin to show me different things about my current industry that I was able to use in the other industry, so on, diff different things like that, right? And so I believe that if you're going to start a business or you feel that God is, is, uh, is giving you that vision for your life, for your family, um, I believe that it's super important for you to um, include God in your plans, right? I have had people come and talk to me that, are in business or want to get in business, but that's not God's will for their life. And why, why, do I, why can I say that? Why can I, you know, I'm not a pastor. I'm not their pastor. You know, how can I say that? Because I can see their results. I can see how they manage money. You know, and so, and I'm looking at that and I'm like, you know what? This is not God's will for your life, you know? So you got to make sure if you're going to be in business, and this is, this is what I think. If you're saved and you're going to be in business, it's got to be God's will for your life. You got to make sure, you got you to feel confident in that. And God will give you confirmation. God will help you. God will open doors for you and do different things. And so, um, I don't know if I answered your question, but I, I rambled a little bit there. So, but anyhow, um, if you feel that God's pressing on you to open a business, go for it. it your, your mind will be blown at what he can do. And so, but if you're not, stay away from it, you know, <laughs> invest in mutual funds. So, yeah, stay safe. I know you said find a financial advisor. Is that is that something you have, you should do after you get out of debt, or what's I mean? No, I think that you should educate yourself as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the things I like about Dave Ramsey's platform and all his stuff is, like I said, you can you fill out all this stuff, and he can he'll he'll send you. So I went on there, I tried it, right, and I said, Hey, I need a financial advisor. What are you? Boom, 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 boom. Like 10 different people, four of them locally. Hey, you know what? We believe in what Dave Ramsey, if you know what Dave Ramsey believes in, what does he believe in? He has Christian morals, values. He believes in, you know, all the stuff that we've been talking about. So these people, they have to share the same values as him. And so I would find a financial advisor because when you find somebody that you like, you don't have to start investing with them that very day. You know what I mean? It's, it's free to go talk to them. But you begin to see, hey, you know what? When I'm ready or as soon as I'm ready, I know where to go. Um, 
and and you can you can start getting advice. And some of these people, man, this is this is what their this is their life. This is what they love to do. They love to talk about it. They love to help people with money. And you're able to benefit so much from finding somebody like that. The guy that I use right now, so I used to use Ray Veria. He, you know, he passed away, um, you know, pretty young. The guy that I use handles his money still. And he was one of his guys. And he kind of has the same, you know, uh, um, attitude, you know, perspective. I can talk to him for hours and it's, it's really good. And when you find somebody like that, it's very helpful because they begin to help you with different things of life, not just, you know, like our CPA is a Dave Ramsey endorsed. And so we're able to discuss more than just taxes, you know, and so. And, and uh, Dave Ramsey, the thing you're talking about, that's free? To yeah. That initial part? Go on, the go on the website. Go on the website. There's tons of material there, tons of information. Yep. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Another question? So at some point, you're going to have to you're going to have to make the decisions yourself. You're going to have to say, this guy's good for me or this guy's not good for me. Nobody can make that decision for you. Right. And God is going to help you. If you pray, you believe God for this area of your life. God's going to help you and direct you with the right people so that you can make these decisions. But one of the one of the the the, the worst things that I that I see sometimes is people that are very educated about this area and people that are not so educated, and these people over-influence them to make them feel that they're not doing the best thing that they could be doing. Because there's fees. You're going to invest, there's fees. You're going to, you know, you're going to have your money. Somebody's making money for you. They got to charge you. You know, it's, it's just, it's right. And so some of the things that they can be like, oh, you're paying too many fees over there, or that fund is no good, or that company's no good. Like, okay, you know, you're learning, you're going to get educated. I've been, like I said, I've been at wealth management departments at banks. I've been directly with, you know, with the big broker. I've been, and I'm, look, I'm at Farmers, and I have a fund that's great. I can show it to you. It does great, you know. Uh, 89 years, average return, 11.75%, something like that. That's great. I mean, if you ask me, very much fun. So, anyhow, uh, it's just about getting started, getting educated. Any other questions? I know that I always have a mini line afterwards for the questions that don't want to be. So anybody else? No? We're good? Okay, so next week we're going to get into financial legacy. And um, it's really cool. You know, once God starts to help you, <clears throat> start to establish you, uh, you begin to feel the responsibility for your children. Begin to feel the responsibility for the money that he's put in your hands. And the last thing you would want is, hey, you know what? God blessed you with all this. And the end result of that resource didn't get used for what God really intended it to be. And so we're going to look at that uh, next week. So thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you all for coming.